What's up everybody? So ever since I made my video on Cube Browser, I've actually gotten a lot of questions on how I do my note taking, since that was one of the many things that I showed off in my video. And one of the main things that I showed off was that I use Vim and Org Mode, which a lot of people would be kind of surprised by, since most people that use Org use Emacs, and most people that use Vim for note taking probably use something like Markdown and Vim Wiki. So in this video, I'm going to try and answer why do I use Org Mode with Vim, and why don't I use any of the alternative options. If you guys are interested in content similar to this one, then go ahead and click that like button, subscribe to this channel, and hit that bell icon so you guys will get notified of my next video. So what actually is org mode? And this question is a pretty simple one to answer. It's basically a plain text way to take notes and do general life management. That's kind of where the org comes from, as far as I know, is organization, um, which is pretty awesome and allows you to do a lot of other stuff that uh, I won't really be covering in the video since most of this is supposed to be about note taking. Org mode was originally intended actually for Emacs, but at this point there are lots of services, applications, and editors that have full support for org mode um, and its file format org. So now why do I particularly use org mode? And the main reason is that I wanted something that was plain text since I wanted to be able to store it, make it portable to other platforms since text is pretty much always available. On top of that, I also wanted it to be readable so that way I could actually just look at it without any syntax highlighting and understand it. And I also wanted to have integration between my to-do list, my notes, when things are scheduled, and kind of as like a mix between a calendar and a note-taking system. Another big draw for me was the fact that I wanted to be able to integrate it with Vim, since that was the text editor I was using, and I wanted to be able to integrate it with any text editor I used in the future. Luckily, due to org mode's popularity, this is already pretty successful. I can use it with pretty much any text editor. The amount of functionality will be limited depending on the text editor, but most popular text editors have support for org mode in some capacity. Now, in addition to that, I also wanted to have support for actually using it from the shell. So for example, I wanted to be able to quickly access my notes, add a new note, search for a note, everything like that, just from the shell without having to basically look for it by hand or trying to use grep. I wanted to be able to do it nice and quick. Luckily, once again, due to the simplicity of how org mode actually works with basically just using plain text, I can actually do this really easily using tools like FCF, which I'll show off in this video. Now to convey how useful org mode actually is for my specific use case of trying to keep my to-do list together with my notes, we'll give you guys a really quick example. One of the most simple examples would be getting an assignment from your university. So let's go ahead and do that. So say I have a new, new thing I need to do, I can just use the command note, which then will open it up and prepare me to enter in something to do. So let's go ahead and do this. So we're gonna do a test. So test the university website. So now, there we go, we've added our first to-do item. Nice and easy, just like that. Now, sometimes you might be specific to a class, so we're just gonna put the class. This way, when we need to reference it later, we can actually check and see which class each thing was for, because say, for example, we wanted to filter it, that might be useful. Now, say that we have a lot of other assignments for other classes, or for the same class, we may wanna set a priority. So let's go ahead and do that. So I've set the priority of this to A, so it is the highest priority. Now the template that I'm using to actually manage this actually has a little spot down here for schedule. So if I press a special key binding, it will actually set me up to set the date. So by default, it uses the current date. Now instead, what I could do is I could actually do control A and I can go up each day or say I wanna go up 30 days, I do 30, control A, that goes up 30 days, 30 day control X, goes back 30 days so I can change it just like that very easily. So say that we wanted to work on it, um, let's just undo all that and go back to the current date. And so now we're at the current date. And so say that I wanted to just schedule to get this done tomorrow. So I'd go up by one day, but say this assignment has a deadline, which most assignments do, we could actually use a quick little snippet to expand that to a deadline. We can set the deadline to maybe three days from now on Wednesday. There's our current deadline and our scheduled time. So this is already something that you can't really get out of something like Markdown or Vim Wiki, at least as far as I know. Obviously, there's different versions of Markdown, and I'm sure there's some that support some weird settings like this. Now, like I mentioned before, the major reason that I wanted to do this is I wanted to integrate my notes with my actual to-do items. So the biggest thing that I wanted to do is include stuff like information like this. Now, this is a really simple example, but you could go a lot further by maybe having something more complex. So here's just a block of text that would act as an example of some text that we could include. Now on top of that, we also may have some extra steps that we may want to include, so let's go ahead and do that. 
So for example, we want to check our course page, but there might be sub steps to that. So let's go ahead and make some sub ones. So here are some sub steps to this one part of the checklist. And then maybe we have some extra one that doesn't relate to it, like check home page. So here we go. So we've got some sub steps to this. And we could actually add our own sub steps actually as its own separate to do by doing star star and then removing this. And there we go. So now we actually have it as its own step um, where we can add extra, extra text specific to it. But in this case, we'll just leave it as a checklist item. Now, one of the cool things about this is we can actually do some really neat functionality, which is built into the plugin that I'll show off earlier, where we can do CIC and it will check off one of our to-do list items and then say that this is in progress. And then finally, once they're all checked, it will be done. Same goes for the next one. So pretty simple. And this is super useful if you guys have a pretty complex project that you're working on. On top of that, you can actually add extra things like instead of just to do and done, you can maybe have next, which will be related to the next thing that needs to be done, or you can have waiting. You can actually customize it to include any specific state that something can be in, which is super useful, especially for group projects, because sometimes you can't get onto your work until they're done with their work. Now, like I mentioned before, we can have a subtask and let's go ahead and make that. So we're going to do to do. Note that my setup actually automatically capitalizes to do just for my convenience because I don't want to have to capitalize it every time. That group started. So check that group has started their part. Now here I can add some extra text, like especially Jake, that guy sucks. And the big advantage here that we get out of this is that we get some more functionality. Now on top of this, you can actually link to different files like you'd expect with VimWiki and all the other stuff. And you can actually link to websites. So we could do something like this. So now here we can make a link to example code. And then when I go into escape, it will actually conceal it. So that way I can see, oh, this is a link, but I don't actually need to worry about having it all expanded and hard to read. And then if it was actually a link, I could just use uh, Vim's GF to jump to it. So now when it comes to how I actually use org with Vim, I actually use the plugin uh, Vim do to. Um, I've tried pretty much every other plugin there is, and this one seems to be my personal favorite. Um, it has some really nice features on it, which most of them aren't shown off, but the key bindings are pretty simple and they kind of show off in here. Um, there's a couple of views of the agenda view, um, it actually has a lot of neat features for actually time management and time tracking, which I don't really use the time tracking too much, but I use the to-do functionality and everything like that. Now, looking at it from within Vim, I'm just gonna give you guys a quick view of some of the neat features. So if I do G Shift A, um, this won't usually be the text prompt. This is just a patch that I am working on to help the development of this program. But if I do A, it will give me that agenda view. So it'll tell me when things are due. So this was due like an hour ago, two days from now. I can get a nice agenda view and I can do uh, my to-dos, my tags, my notes, all that sort of stuff. And then if I actually go into the agenda like we were doing before, I can actually go forward in time. I can go backwards in time and just check for each of the dates. I can actually filter by tag, by tags. And then we're going to go for class 101. And then it will filter it just down to everything that has the tag class 101, which is the one that we made earlier. Then I can hit enter. It will take me to it and then I can edit it however I need. Now, another thing that drives me to use it is its capture features. The way that I use it is actually not using the native capture feature, partly just because I've kind of messed around with this a bit. I found a way that works, but I think the native capture feature is great and it functions pretty similar to this. So you do G capital C to capture and then it will basically open up a separate window where you can actually enter in a new to do. And then you can schedule it just like I was doing before. And I also have a special thing that you could probably do um, with the base capture features. I actually haven't uh, done that myself, but now say I'm in this file over here, I can do GC like we did before and then check this out and then it will enter in today's date. And then it will actually give me a link to whatever file and the line number that I'm on. So then I can do say laptop. Um, and then I get a nice little link and I can even do a jump to it and it will take me exactly to the line that I was on before. So this is super useful, especially if you guys are working on projects and you like to kind of keep your own little to do's um, that aren't related to anything like maybe a fix me or anything like that that you'd actually put in the source code or its own issue on GitHub. This is super useful just to kind of keep track of what's going on in each of your projects all in one place. Now on top of that, it has most of the features you'd expect like folding and it actually uses Vim's native key binding for folding, which I find is super useful because a lot of other options try to 
map your keys for you, which I don't really like. I prefer to extend Vim instead of changing Vim, if that makes sense. So I would prefer to make my own key bindings and just use Vim's native folding features. And then if you want to add a mapping to uh, adapt the folding to your needs, it's super easy and you can map it however you need. For example, I map enter in normal mode to ZA, which alternates folding, which can be pretty useful for this sort of a use case because it's pretty similar to how it works in Emacs's org mode. I think it's important that I mention some other plugin options. Uh, one of them is Vim org mode, which is pretty popular, but it is no longer maintained. Um, and it has some pretty big negatives like using Python 2, which I believe is still what is used in the actual code base, which means that you have the dependency of Python and you actually need to make sure that's compatible. Plus, since it's not maintained, I'm not really too sure whether I could really recommend something like this, but it does try to be a lot more of an Emacs style alternative to this and it remaps bindings. So if that's something that you want, maybe it's worth checking out. Now, another alternative that I actually can recommend is actually looking at org.vim. So this plugin is super simple. It basically just provides syntax highlighting and folding. So if you don't actually care about all those extra features and you'd rather have a much more simple plugin, then this might be the route to go for you, especially if you just wanted to rely on something like Orgsly or some other tool to do all your management like that, then this is where it may come into play. Or maybe if you just want to use Emacs for some of that extra stuff instead, then it's another option. I've actually used it in the past and that's why my capture feature is kind of different from the default way that it works in Vim do to is because I used to use this and my capture was actually done just using some simple Vim script. So that's kind of where this comes into play is that if you like hacking things together, then uh, org.vim might be a better fit for you instead of using something as large as vim do to. Now, a big thing for me was actually being able to integrate this workflow into my shell. So like I said before, I have a note alias, which will actually just um, set me up to basically write a simple to do in my refile file, which is where, like I said before, all my quick little notes will go until I have a chance to move them into their appropriate file. Now on top of that, I actually have another one, which is just FN. And this will give me a really simple way to actually search through my notes for specific lines of text. So say for example, I did, I wanted to find that note that we had before, and I know it was something like website class. Oh, there it is. Using FCF, I was able to find it nice and quick. And so that way I don't really need to actually memorize specific ways to search. I can just kind of get some nice, simple, fuzzy searching going on. Now I'll put a link in the description to a file containing these aliases and other shell related stuff that I've mentioned in this video. So let's answer a question that I'm assuming a lot of you guys are probably wondering, and that's why don't I just use Emacs? Emacs even has evil mode, which can simulate Vim bindings. So why don't I just use something simple like that? And the answer to that is the fact that as much as I like org mode and I think it's a totally awesome file format, I never really got into Emacs. I've given Emacs a few tries. I've even used it for a few weeks, almost a month even. And I've seen that there's a lot of benefits to it, like org babble, um, the GUI goodness of having preview images, preview LaTeX, all that sort of stuff inside of your notes is really awesome. And that's not even mentioning all the extensions and plugins that exist out there in the world that I'm sure I'll hear about in the comments below. However, the real thing that kept me away from sticking with Emacs was the fact that evil mode always just felt like a second class citizen. It felt a lot less like what you'd expect. A lot of people like to say, oh, well, you get all the Vim bindings inside of Emacs, but that's not really the case. You get the Vim bindings when you're doing normal editing inside of Emacs, but a lot of times plugins aren't optimized for that sort of thing you're doing a lot of extra configuration yourself and you're basically spending half your time making your configuration just to emulate a tool that you already have so now there's the other question that people are thinking is why would i just use something like doom emacs or space emacs and the biggest reason for that is that i don't really like complexity unless i've put it on myself for example, if I'm using a plugin, even for Vim, I want one that's gonna be pretty minimal and allows me to do the configuration myself instead of having to work around the plugin. Instead, I want it to be something simple that I can work into my normal day-to-day -day workflow. Now, minimizing the amount of actual configuration, including inside of the plugins, actually avoids having more bugs in my configuration, as well as allowing me to avoid dependency on other creators. I don't want to have to actually be maintaining someone else's work where they have a thousand lines of configuration just to make their plugin work, or even more than that, when the developer decides to abandon the project. That's not really what I want to do. I'd rather have something simple so that way if the creator did abandon it, I could still pretty much use it the same way it is at this current point. 
Now that might sound a bit contradictory if you've ever seen my Vim configuration. It's pretty far from small, and in fact it's a bit complex, and I could probably shorten it down a bit more. But the big reason that it's so complex is because instead of using big plugins for the most part, there are a few of them that are pretty big, like Vim Fugitive, I pretty much keep it all separate into small plugins, and then I configurate them to work together. One example of this would be instead of using Cock. Uh, conqueror of completion which a lot of people use for their completion for all their language server protocol stuff like jumping to definitions i prefer to use something like mu complete which basically uses vim's uh, native completion and then you can kind of bootstrap other completion frameworks to work along with it and then to work alongside mu complete i use a plugin like vim lsp or vim lsc which basically provides all the language server protocol stuff as its own plugin and then i integrate the completion from those plugins into mu complete that way I get very similar to native Vim completion, but I also get the intelligent completion that you'd expect with something like Cock. This gives me a nice way to configure things however I want, and then if for some reason I want to switch to a different language server protocol plugin, as long as I have a way to bootstrap it to work with Mu Complete, it should work the same. And since the way Mu Complete works is it doesn't really rely on a lot of stuff, I can pretty much just take it as long as it's working at the time that the developer abandons it, I can pretty much just take it and it'll continue to work the exact same. Now, back to how this actually relates to my setup with Emacs. So for something like Emacs, if I was using something like Doom Emacs, then I'd be relying on someone else's configuration, and then I'd be doing exactly what I don't want to do, which is relying on too many people to configure too many things, and then once one thing breaks, I have to basically completely understand the entire setup for the entire distribution of Emacs, versus if I just used base Emacs, then at least I'm only having to worry about what works in Emacs itself. Now Emacs itself is already very complicated and is a bit confusing if you're working around with it versus with Vim, that's not really quite the case. The complexity is there, but it's not quite as in your face as it is with Emacs since Emacs has so much built into it. And finally, there's the whole fact that if I'm just using evil with Emacs, then instead of getting what I'm talking about with Vim, where I have less dependency and everything can kind of get put together, I'm basically trying to just work around the evil plugin to make everything work with it, which is not really going to end up working out anywhere near as well as I would like it to. As a result, I end up having even more configuration than I already have in my VimRC, and then I'm also trying to bootstrap these other plugins to work together, and eventually something's going to break, and it's going to require me to do much more work just to maintain it. Now, there are a few examples of where this might not be true, but from my experience, this is kind of how it's been. The big exception would be the fact that Emacs' Lisp is actually a lot easier to write than Vim script, but now that NeoVim has Lua, maybe I'll consider moving over to that for most of my configuration, since in the end Lua is going to be a lot easier to work with than trying to use Vim script, which can be a bit hectic to work around. Now I should also mention that this is all personal preference. I'm not saying that this is a hard-on rule for everyone. This is my experience and this is how I like to work. Now, if you don't feel the same way about these sort of things, that's totally reasonable. I'm just trying to explain why I do the things I do. Anyways, guys, I hope you enjoyed this really quick introduction and explanation of the why I do the things I do, how I use org mode with Vim, why I use it, and I have a few things in the future that will kind of explain a bit more of my workflow, but for the most part, this is how my desktop portion of it works. In a future video, I'll be covering an Android app that actually integrates with org mode really well and is probably one of the biggest reasons that I've actually stuck with it. But unfortunately, this video is already getting a bit long, so I should probably cut it off here and save that for a future video. If you guys have enjoyed this, make sure you subscribe, hit the bell icon so you guys will get notified of my next video, and let me know what you guys think. If you guys have any comments, if you guys have any improvements, if you guys think I missed something, anything like that, feel free to hit me up um, in the comments. Like this video if you enjoyed it. Anyways, guys, I'll see you next time. Have a good one.